Okay, so I've been working on uh, privacy solutions. You know, been thinking about designing, uh, advising, investing in these pro privacy protocols for the past two years. And I'm here to talk to you today about some of the techniques that we have in programmable cryptography that can help us achieve trust minimized privacy solutions, achieving anonymity and confidentiality. So here's the outline of what I'm going to do for the next 15 to 20 minutes. First, we'll look a little bit at how we even define privacy, in particular, trust, minimi trust, minimi trust minimization and the different types of privacy that we'd like to achieve. And we'll look through two case studies, in particular, voting and dark pools, or kind of privacy preserving order books, uh, as case studies to help us understand how these tools in cryptography can help us achieve those goals. So, trust minimization is a spectrum. On the left hand side, you have systems that require a central operator who may have access to user, user information. So earlier today, we have seen Facebook or Google being used as examples as these centralized solutions. And on the right-hand side, we have something that's fully self-sovereign. Earlier today, we also have seen examples where zero-knowledge proofs or two-party computation can help you both have control of your data as well as prove certain properties about it or do computation jointly with other people over your data. But in the middle, is what I call trust minimized solutions, where you don't necessarily have a central operator, but you have some type of threshold trust assumption that allows you to do more powerful uh, computation over your data with this type of uh, tr delegated trust. And there's no concrete number I think uh, we can pin down where we can call something fully trust minimized. And, and you know, I think it's a moving target. The, the more parties that need to kind of collaborate to get your uh, pri private data, the harder it is to do that and, and the more trust minimized it is. And the next thing I want to talk about is really what does a application look like? And when I'm talking about a, a distributed application with distributed application, I'm talking about um, an application where there are multiple users that can access an application in a permissionless manner. And the application might also in the back end manage a, a set of resources. And each resource on the right-hand side here, oh, laser doesn't work, uh, might be owned by one or more users. So, for example, a voting proposal um, snapshots is a resource that everybody on, in the DAO can contribute to. And the first thing I'm going to show here is, um, sort of hands, how many people here are familiar with this interface? Great, okay, we're at a um, uh, Ethereum conference. So this is, of course, Etherscan. So I'm going to be defining a couple of notions of privacy through this interface. The first thing is anonymity. Um, if a system is able to hide the address of the users that's interacting with the application, I will call that application anonymous. And second, if you can hide the contents of this transaction that you see on Etherscan, then we can say that this application is confidential. And when, um, as, so as it turns out, as applications get more and more complicated, there might be more and more resources that have shared owners, right? And, and so um, if this action reveals which, which resource a user is getting access to, then it's not terribly private. So for example, if there are multiple NFT auctions running in parallel and you're submitting a bid for a particular NFT, if the system reveals exactly which NFT you're interested in, it is not really terribly private. And so, in addition, for these applications where there's a lot of shared resources, we'll also like to have obliviousness, meaning we'll like to hide the access pattern that the users are incurring. And I'm gonna skip that slide. <laughs> so, okay. Um, and for the rest of the talk, let me talk about the tool sets that we have to achieve these properties. And on the left-hand side, we'll have trusted execution environments, um, or TEAS uh, for short. They're, of course, kind of by definition, by naming, they're trusted. So they shift trust from the hardware operators to the hardware providers or the hardware makers, right? So like Intel or Apple. And 
it's definitely in the more trusted regime, and so I'm not going to be talking uh, about it too much in this talk. And on the right-hand side here, we have uh, the, the, the techniques that you, know, you guys have been hearing about today, such as zero-knowledge proofs, multi-party computation, um, fully homomorphic encryption, and I'm going to add one more thing, which is called uh, oblivious RAM. And so let us start by thinking about an example that we'd like to add uh, privacy for. And, and let's talk about voting. And broadly speaking, there are two types of voting applications. One, where your, vo your voting power is depending on the stake that you have in the system. Right? So token-based voting is a great example of this. And on the other hand, we have voting systems where one person gets one vote. Okay, so there's, uh, um, in some sense, the voting power that every single vote sub uh, voter submits is fungible. And, and they kind of lead to two different types of uh, uh, systems. And also the second property that distinguishes different voting systems are uh, um, public aggregation or private aggregation. So whether the votes are aggregated publicly or are they somehow like, aggregated privately and then only the result of that is released. And a third property that might distinguish these uh, systems is collusion resistance or deniability. So I'm not going to be talking about that here, but there are solutions that kind of help uh, achieve this property, in particular uh, the Macy project from PSE. So first, let us look at anonymous voting, meaning in this setting, everybody has one vote, and you would like to vote yes or no without really revealing that you, know, you voted yes or no, right? And, and so, and in this setting, we can tol tolerate public aggregation. Uh, and, and a good example of this is, for example, NFT membership-based voting. And the tool that we have for this uh, that is really well known at this point is uh, ZK Shorted Pools. So the, the rough intuition um, for, for this primitive is you have a set of objects. Sometimes they're called notes. Sometimes they're called records. Uh, and you want to reveal one item one note from this set without revealing which one you have referred to. And in alongside that, you also want to sign a message alongside with your, um, you know, re revealing that you have item in, in this set. So the ZK Shooter Pool uh, construction really just has three parts. One, this set will be insertion only, meaning you can only add to the set, and it's committed to using some type of commitments uh, such as uh, incremental Merkle tree. And if you want to add to the set, you can simply add elements to it. And all these elements are, are either encrypted or committed to so that their actual contents are not uh, revealed. And finally, to, rev to re remove or signal from, from a item, you simply have to make a zero-knowledge proof that you know the contents of the item in the set and you reveal a context-dependent nullifier. And so this construction has been used extensively in privacy systems to date including uh, pretty much all privacy solutions uh, that you have seen kind of on Ethereum, uh, like uh, Aztec, uh, Nocturne, or as well as kind of private voting schemes such as Semaphore. And so how would this look like for voting is that your set will, com will compose of the set of users that is able to vote uh, for a particular ballot. And users simply prove that they have the ability to vote, they're part of the set, and reveal a public vote, which are then publicly aggregated on chain. And in, this, in, in such a way, you're not able to see the, uh, you know, which user had voted for which outcome. And this has been uh, you know, pretty well known so far. We have a lot of practical schemes that achieve this property. So let me move on to the next example. What if we want to add privacy for stake-based voting? For stake-based voting, the amount of tokens that each, each uh, person, well, each voter has in this system, if you reveal the voting preference for a particular amount of token, you're basically revealing who voted uh, for that, right? Because uh, in these systems, this stake is highly variable and, and highly uh, identifying. And so we would like to hide the aggregation as well, in, in, in this case, to be able to get privacy for, for um, the voting system. So this is where what I call uh, confidential compute come in. So a conf confidential compute device effectively computes over encrypted information 
that is encrypted to uh, the comp computer comp computing um, device. <laughs> uh, and so the way to think about this is that the secrets are relayed from the user to a shared functionality, and the shared functionality can, is able to compute circuits over it and release some outputs publicly. And the, and the output release is programmatic. You can, you can uh, so the user does not get to decide, and there's, you can think of almost like a smart contract deciding how, what to do with user information and which part of it to release. Um, and so this can be realized using MPC with threshold type assumptions. And with FHG, this becomes more efficient if you have a larger set of nodes. And recently, we have seen examples of this. For example, FHG EVM by Zama is such a system. OK, what can we do if we have a computer compute uh, structure? Is that for voting, alongside revealing that you have stake in the system so that you can vote, you can also encrypt your vote to this system. Right, so in, in, in the confidential compute unit will simply aggregate all the votes privately inside and release a public result of, of, the, of, the, of, of the ballot. In such a way, you can also get privacy for uh, state-based voting with slightly, uh, you know, some added trust assumptions. Okay, so it turns out this paradigm is really powerful. If you simply combine a shorted pool using ZK, plus a competition compute unit that support limited computations for certain circuits, you're able to get broad class applications. So what I just showed you that works for voting can also, vote, uh, can also work for, for example, auctions. And for, in that setting, you're able to hide effectively uh, all the bids besides for the winning bids. Or uh, I, the auctions actually extend to something like a cross sale, right, where you, not, you don't necessarily have one winner. And recently, uh, um, this has also been um, you know, implemented in protocols such as Penumbra, which if, ex effectively is um, a limited form of DART pool where you're able to uh, net trades privately before they're settled onto a automated market maker. Okay, so let's move on to the next thing. When applications get more complicated, there are more resources that are held within an uh, uh, application. So I used the example before where there's a lot of, uh, uh, for example, NFT auctions on, on a platform and you don't want to reveal which one you're bidding for. And it turns out this is a pattern that shows up repetitively in larger applications. So take an example of a dark pool, or you can think of it as an order book exchange where you would like to hide the orders. In such a setting, there are a lot of orders on, these, uh, on this system. And when you submit an order, you do not want to reveal to the operators here, you know, which is a, a blockchain system, which order your order matched against, right? And, and, and this is, in some sense, in, in a different regime of, of uh, you know, something like voting, where you can have a simple MPC circuit that takes care of this. And, and so this is where this class of solutions called oblivious RAMs come in. Um, and Tying this to a confidential compute unit, we, what you can think of is really that there's a public set of encrypted records that your confidential CPU gets access to. And whenever it decides to access one, meaning you wants to read or write to one, you cannot publicly observe which one was read from or uh, 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 were written to. And with this primitive, you're able to run data structures now over encrypted, um, over encrypted data instead of just running circuits. So here's an example uh, of roughly how you would add that to the previous control we just saw to build something like a, a fully older book uh, supported dark pool. We simply connect the shorted pool to a computational compute unit that is connected to uh, you know, external memory via oblivious RAM. And now you can run sorting algorithms and, and you know, things of that sort to be able to get a better performance. Okay, so you might have recalled, in the beginning, we tried to use uh, zk shielded pools for an anonymity. Can this primitive, oblivious RAM, be used for anonymity as well? 
right? Intuit is very similar. We're trying to hide access patterns. So the difference, if you think about it, is that for uh, Oblivious RAM, the action is taken from the, co the computer compute unit, not from the user, right? Because this, this, this data is, is owned by, you know, the MPC module or the trusted hardware module, um, logically. And for the CK shorted pool, it's owned by the user. The user initiated the action. And, and that really is a crucial difference. But nevertheless, this can still be used for um, an anonymity. So for example, in mobile coin, this was utilized to get kind of Zcash-like privacy. And I realized uh, the full slides I made didn't quite make it to here, so let me kind of just talk over this blank slide. Um, and, you know, and yeah, so this is the end of my talk. We have seen a lot of techniques that, that we get to use. So ZK shorted pools, MPC, FPG, plus now uh, ORAN for bigger application with more shared resources. And there are a lot of open problems in this space. Uh, we do not have enough tools. And even theoretically, uh, so, some of the connection points, for example, how would you would connect the GK Shielded pool uh, in a most efficient manner into a MPC or FHE, you know, computer computes units, it, it is uh, not terribly clear. And, and so, yeah, there's a lot of work to do here from both uh, the theoretical front as well as just building better tools. And let me in here and, and take questions. Thank you. Um.